Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap for the Week. In this one, we'll be talking about Linus from Linus Tech Tips announcing that he is stepping down from the role of CEO at his companies, but he's still staying at the companies in a creative capacity. So we'll be talking about the changes there, what that means for LMG and what their plans are, and some of our own thoughts on the situation. Additionally, there's been some news in the last week about more burning RTX 4090s and melting adapters or connectors. And we have some information we've dug up on that as well to provide some more context. And as another major story, but not the final one for the news this week, we'll be going over Gigabyte and Asus having additional commentary on VSOC. Although Asus, we're gonna have one more follow up on. So we'll leave most of that discussion to that video. But Gigabyte posted some uh, comments about VSOC that we want to cover as well. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake and their new Series 500TG ARGB mid-tower case. The Thermaltake Series case is perforated all on the front panel and the power supply shroud, including perforations on the cable side of the case for further ventilation to the PSU and hard drive chamber of the case. A separate access door for hard drives makes the case easy to work with for 3.5 inch storage, or the door can be swapped out for a separate LCD panel kit that displays system information. Other features include a GPU support kit, vertical mounting, and a hinged glass panel. Learn more at the link in the description below. So first one, Linus from Linus Tech Tips announced yesterday at the time of posting this probably, May 18th, that he is stepping down from the role of CEO at Linus Media Group, Floatplane Media, and Creator Warehouse, and all three of these are Linus's companies. You've likely heard of most of them at this point. This is a planned departure from the role, and uh, although it came as a surprise for the audience and probably the community at large, it wasn't a surprise at this point for Linus. They were working on this. Linus intends to depart his role on July 1st, at which point they'll have a new CEO take over the helm, and uh, Linus will remain at the companies in what he more or less outlined as a creative capacity. Linus and his wife Yvonne retain full control over the company, so they remain full and sole owners of them. Uh, however, Linus's team is appointing a more corporate CEO to helm those companies. Now, on this, when giving reasons for the change, Linus noted the following, quote, I wasn't built for this and I'm tired, like really can't do this anymore tired. If I try to drag myself through another 10 years of business administration, I know I'm going to destroy myself and probably end up killing the company and community I love so much in the process. I'm at my best when I'm pitching new content or product ideas. When speaking to the positive side of the change, Linus seemed more upbeat and said the following. My new role is going to be Chief Vision Officer, which is a stupid BS sounding made up role. Those are his words. Uh, but I think it's the best one. I'm still going to be charting the path that I think makes sense. You can expect to see me on camera just as much as you used to, and ideally maybe more. Now following this, and for some additional background, Linus noted that he needs help with managing resources of the company uh, and noted that he intends to carry on in a more focused and creative capacity, but wants to step back from the business administration side of it. So his focus will be more on projects rather than on resource management. And as such, Linus and his team announced their new chief executive officer, Taryn Tong. Tong worked in a director level position at Dell since September of 2021. Prior to that, Ton worked at Corsair for nine years with positions including Senior Director of Marketing, Business Development for Pre-built Systems such as Origin PCs, Director of Sales, and uh, Canada Country Manager? He was the manager of Canada? Why did Linus say that? This guy's been a president. At least one person in the comments will think that that's what I actually think that phrasing means. In those positions though, noting specifically that during his time at Origin PC, which is owned by Corsair, he had leadership and revenue and margin for 2021. Ton also managed relationship development with megacorps like Best Buy, Target, Microsoft, and Walmart. Prior to these positions, Ton worked at NCIX, and for the few of you who might not know, it was sort of like the Tiger Direct or the Newegg of computers except in Canada. And notably, he was Linus's boss in that position. This seems like a pretty natural move for a corporation with over 100 employees at this point, which is insane to think about, and one that makes sense. Uh, I personally have no plans to ever scale to that size, but I can still at least understand the YouTube specific pressures of the job position um, that Linus has been in and for some part will remain in, but adding that to the administration and corporate requirements of a, a 100 strong plus company with multiple locations and business units, it's a lot. So 
the change here, it seems like a move he's happy about. It seems like a logical move. It's one that'll reduce his stress probably relating to the job. And, uh, and maybe next time there's a channel hack event, he won't be the one I have to call at 3 a.m. to warn about it. So we wish Linus well, and we're happy he's in a position he's more happy with or comfortable with. And uh, the primary change is that reduction of administration responsibilities. And of that, Linus said this. The biggest change is in reporting, he said. No one will report directly to me anymore. If there's an issue with salary transparency or the snacks in the lunchroom or the warranty on the backpack or whatever, I promise you, I give you my personal guarantee, trust me, bro, whatever it is, there is somebody else who's in charge of that. And that is by design. The buck stops with the new CEO. And that's why relating to this issue specifically, getting into sort of GN's stance or GN's thoughts on this, there's not really any change in GN's commentary or stance or whatever towards Linus Tech Tips and Linus Media Group in general. This is just, this is what large companies do. They change out CEOs uh, and they bring in leaders from massive companies with leadership abilities and history. So. Nine months ago, we mentioned or announced a shifting in our position towards LTT from uh, simply sort of friendly YouTuber or collaborator to treating it more like a company, a manufacturer, and a, a large organization that it has become. And, and this is exactly why the company has gotten massive. So it's doing big company things at this point, and that's why we made that move. We sort of saw the trajectory here and hence the we're going to treat them like a manufacturer and a company now position we took. So uh, we know LTT is, or LMG as a whole, has had a recent valuation of at least $100 million. So I, based on that, there's really no change in our viewpoint of how we treat LMG as uh, an entity to report on in the news like we would, say, Corsair or Origin PC or Walmart or whoever it may be. And that's especially true when now the leadership comes from uh, at least working with some of those companies, if not working for some of those companies. So that's why we took the stance nine months ago and nothing really changes there. You're not gonna see much of a shift in how we treat the situation. But Linus remains at the company. We're happy that he is in a position that is more comfortable for him now. I 100% understand the stress of working on YouTube and what that entails, I can't really imagine the stress of 100 people, but I kind of I kind of get it from the administration side. So the move makes sense, and it sounds like the direction that LTT or LMG is going is one that is continuing to focus on scale and growth, which is something that Linus also mentioned in his announcement. Up next, we recently had a massive influx of emails from you all about a video from Northridge Fix, which is a company that focuses on repairing products for end users like solder repair and also makes videos containing commentary about them. So this video is about 4090s and the melting problem. Once again, it comes back. Northridge Fix posted a video titled 4090 FE connector melted with cable mod adapter installed. 40 series cards should be recalled. Alex at Northridge Fix showed a melted cable mod connector installed to a 40 series card, and while filming, he was interrupted by staff who brought him another 40 series card. He remarked that he's had one after the other lately. The title in here is pretty spicy and is what caused the sudden influx of emails from you all asking us to talk about this again. First and foremost, uh, a, a wide sweeping recall on the 40 series cards in general we think is jumping the gun right now. There's just not sufficient evidence to support that that is necessary for the entire 40 series uh, or necessarily even the 4090s. There's a little more to the story. We're going to talk about that now. But Northridge's main point here, the reasoning for this, was that uh, Alex in particular and Northridge as a shop has seen a sudden increase in 40 series cards for repair. And all of these were related to burned connectors and melted connectors. So we emailed Northridge Fix to ask for photos of the connectors, and we also emailed CableMod, which makes the adapter that's shown in this particular video. Now in this process, we immediately learned from CableMod that it was the customer for the card that was shown in the video, and also a lot of other cards that were recently sent to Northridge. The email with Northridge, it seemed to indicate that Northridge was unaware that CableMod was the customer. They were trying to confirm that at the time we emailed them, which means that at the time the video was made, Northridge was under the impression perhaps that all of these cards they've seen lately were from multiple individuals when it looks like at least about eight of them came from CableMod directly. So there may be, uh, it makes sense why you'd have a conclusion 
that it's a crazy influx and burned 4090s at the same time because there's one sort of corporate client creating a large influx or a sample bias where they're sending all these parts in uh, business to business for repair, but Northridge, at least uh, on camera, was unaware of this at the time. So it seemed odd to us that this issue came back up because it's been mostly silent for months now. We reached out to KaleMod first, and KaleMod produced evidence that it had sent eight GPUs to Northridge for repair in the last three weeks. It noted to us that the very card that appeared in the video was a card that KaleMod had sent in for repair. And this again explains why Northridge assumed the sudden influx was from a big round of failures. Northridge in the video stated, don't tell me about the customer plugging the cable all the way because the customer has a cable mod 90 degree adapter plugged in all the way and the connector still melted. Now there is a little more here where it's possible the customer used the product without that adapter for a while and maybe that wasn't plugged in all the way. Uh, there are also two connection points to plug in at this point. So it's possible that one of those was overlooked and we have some thoughts on that as well. Uh, but Kale Mod told us that it collected these eight GPUs over a period of a few months and some of them are dated and from earlier failures. So they're not all instantaneous failures from recently, but rather they are accumulated over time. Because Northridge Alex was unaware both of Kale Mod being the customer and of the slow accumulation, of these products when he went on camera, we understand why he raised the alarm, uh, but it is too soon to call for a recall for this issue. We asked KaleMod why it even had failed cards to begin with, and the company told us the following, quote, because the cases have been so few compared to our sales, we did it in the following way. If people contact us about a melting issue in combination with our adapter and the GPU brand refuses to grant the warranty, then we ask the user to pack up the GPU and send it to Northridge Fix. As soon as we get the tracking, we send the users the funds they spent for shipping the GPU and what they paid for the GPU, so they can buy a new one. Once the GPUs are repaired by Northridge Fix, we then give them away. See here for one example. KaleMod continued, it said, we have even replaced GPUs to the end user where it was clearly user error. We see it as marketing and we can afford to help end users in need. As long as the percentage of people that make mistakes stays so low, we can keep helping them out. But if there would be a huge jump in cases, then we would come to our limits, of course. And naturally, a huge jump in cases here might also indicate a wider issue with the engineering perhaps outside of Kale Mod's control. But for now, it sounds like they're going, they're basically doing what the, the video card and GPU manufacturers would typically cover, which is basically an RMA of the card itself. As a last note, Kale Mod said, we collected the cases and needed some time to think about what to do with them, and then we found Northridge. So he got the GPUs we collected for like two months. As for the connectors, we asked Northridge for photos of the adapters. It's too difficult really for us to say for certain what happened based on these photos and without having them in hand and unremoved for an x-ray. And whenever something melts, it does destroy a lot of the evidence. But from this exterior shot, it looks similar to the user failures that we were able to create previously, where you can see what appears to be a burn line about one to two millimeters distant from the fully socketed position. And it appears that this line is off grade across the connector with a one millimeter drop from left to right. That might indicate the user had not fully socketed it, or at least it maybe backed itself out for some other reason when uh, the connector burned, which could lead to a low resistance short or other failures that we discussed in our original piece. And now to be very clear, we don't have that connector in hand. We're just working off some photos. So who knows, that could be completely wrong. But in either case, uh, at this point, it is possible that this is as ever beyond user error, but there's really no new or sufficiently different evidence to change any of the prior conclusions. So the prior conclusions still stand here, which are that it appears to be a combination of both user error and what we called design oversight previously. In other words, a design that uh, is built in such a way that it maybe encourages more user error than would be typical. So an atypical increase in user error because the design makes them feel like it is more fully seated than it perhaps would be, or maybe as you're doing cable management, as we showed in the first couple of videos, you might accidentally start unseating it in an off-level or off-grade way on one side more than the other. Uh, so that would be something you'd call a mix of design oversight for sure, plus user error, because it's a known quantity now. Ideally, you go back in, you reseed it firmly, but it's completely possible that there's something different going on here. So. To do our due diligence, we are working on receiving a few more failed cards. We have two or three on route right now, and uh, we'll do further analysis on these after we get done with Computex. So we're going to be in 
Taiwan for a couple weeks to cover a trade show. And when we come back, we'll work on investigating these cards. Um, and maybe we'll have more information on if we have a different conclusion than before. But hopefully these are, it seems like they're untampered with and maybe still seated. So if that's the case, we should have a pretty clean slate to work with uh, where we can analyze it and see maybe how the user assembled the product. So anyway, as of now, it's premature to call for a recall on the entire 40 series. Um, and we'll look into it further just in case anything new is present. But to us, this appears like no significant change from previously. Up next, some major progress on the AMD VSOC stories we've been posting. So first of all, Asus has now committed to expanding their warranty to basically redact their prior claims uh, and extend the warranty in a way that we think looks much better. It did take a little bit of dragging, kicking, and screaming to get there, but we've gotten there nonetheless. We had to send Asus a number of follow-ups asking for statement, and finally, that's been delivered. Now, Asus's side of this is very interesting. We, we think some of the things they've done here, it got to where it needs to be, and we're happy to see that. It does require some additional depth, though. We're going to talk about that in a dedicated piece tomorrow for a few reasons. One of them is the legal side of it's very interesting, and we worked with uh, a lawyer. We interviewed a lawyer on camera to give some consumer education about your protections as a consumer and how this language initially may have been problematic uh, as opposed to the changes they've made now, which are much more favorable and we think are good changes. So we do want to give some credit to ASUS for that. Um, the only reason we're not super thrilled about it is because the initial handling of the issue. But anyway, that'll be a video tomorrow. Gigabyte has also posted something. So uh, we've seen some people online losing track of the plot of this story because of these corporate statements from Gigabyte and ASUS. Uh, so Gigabyte posted a statement on VSOC measurement and it stated, quote, we would like to address the recent media reports regarding the SOC voltage exceeding 1.3 volts on Gigabyte's AMD AM5 motherboards, especially when Expo is enabled in the latest beta BIOS. They basically are saying that measurements ideally are taken within the silicon and you can use hardware info SBI 3 tfn to take that measurement, which we already knew and a lot of people already knew, but the point isn't getting perfect measurements. The point is being able to prove the fault, which we did. Oh, it's on fire. Yeah, I can smell it. That's, um, that's not supposed to be like that. And to be very clear here, I think because Gigabyte did not name who it was responding to, which is Gigabyte's style, people thought that it was a response to us. But Gigabyte in its own statement says media reports about the latest beta BIOS, which we did not test when they posted this statement. This statement was actually a response to Eris at Hardware Busters. And we greatly respect Eris and the work he does. He's a power engineer. He knows a lot about power. Uh, and he had his own story he ran. We're not going to get into that today, but he covered Gigabyte's latest beta BIOS. This is their response to that. He has since posted some additional, very educational information about all of this and some of his concerns about the fact that you cannot verify an internal measurement uh, with any external tools and have perfect accuracy. So that's kind of his story. We'll let him take care of that. But the point is, to make sure everyone's on the same page, Gigabyte is not responding to the testing we did initially, which remains indicative of the problems that Gigabyte, Asus, and everyone else had with the AMD CPUs. Uh, so objectively, we have video evidence of Gigabyte's F5A BIOS failing in massive and very concerning ways. And just want to make sure everyone remembers, uh, like, don't let the corporate statements where now they are kind of clear of the issue or are starting to become clear of the issue, don't let that misdirect you into thinking it was never an issue because it absolutely was. AMD and the motherboard vendors all came out and said it's an issue and they gave guidance. So. Uh, the only reason kind of charged about that is because of the comments where some people have been twisted and manipulated into thinking it was never a problem because now it is solved. Just because it is beginning to get solved now does not mean it was not one before. So just as a reminder of how the failure worked with Gigabyte previously, we never got to go into depth, so we'll do a little bit here. Upon setting any SOC in the F5A BIOS, which has since been pulled from Gigabyte's website after our video, uh, including VSOC set by Expo or manually, we observed that using the load default button, the load optimized defaults button did not reset BIOS. If you went and hit that button, 
uh, within the menus. And no, this is not down to measurement methodology. This is just a broken BIOS. So this problem we had with Gigabyte, and this is why they weren't responding to us, is a different issue entirely. Uh, this issue has nothing to do with SVI3. It has nothing to do with external measurements. Basically, we noticed that typing in auto, hitting load defaults, uh, and trying to reset the voltage value did not work. And Gigabyte's F5A BIOS would only save the last manually typed entry as we filmed with an external camera to prove it uh, in VSOC. So if you typed 1.4 and you said, oops, that's too high, I thought I was adjusting something else, and then you went and you hit load optimized default, it would remain at the set value of 1.4 but the menu would say auto. So it would kind of look like it changed, but the setting would persist. And this is bad. Now, we haven't revisited this personally, but our understanding and speaking with people who have worked with the latest BIOS is that Gigabyte has resolved this specific issue. This was a separate issue, though, from high VSOC to begin with. And in fact, our original reporting showed that Gigabyte was one of the few vendors that was closer to the tolerances set by AMD at the time. The issue we had is really more specific to user input and a broken load defaults button, which is terrifying because it could lead to accidental or rapid death of a product if a user types the wrong value and thinks they loaded defaults, but actually the board didn't because the VSOC UI element would still reflect uh, a misleading value of auto. Now, Gigabyte's new statement calls the SVI3 value, SVI3TFN within Hardware Info as being uh, accurate or accurately monitoring the VSOC that is relevant here. There are multiple VSOCs, just to be clear, they reflect in different ways. So this is their perfect world representation of VSOC. It's a number we can't externally verify. Ares talks about this in his article, and it's a good write-up. Um, but this statement actually helps our case further because the earlier BIOSes we looked at had an SVI3 TFN that, depending on the board you looked at and the vendor, sometimes would be in excess of 1.3. So it does not matter if the external measurement is not perfectly precise. You cannot get perfectly precise measurements with most external tools with something like this. What you shoot for is good enough to prove the concept and the point and relative accuracy, meaning that if we see a 1.42 volt SOC on the ASUS BIOS, for example, with an external measurement at the back of the socket or adjacent to the socket with the unoccupied pads that you can use to measure VSOC, which is different from the probe points at the edge of the board on the gigabyte boards, if you see those numbers as high as we saw them, the number would have to be so wildly inaccurate as to have a 0.13 volt swing or something like in excess of 10% difference uh, to become a non-concerning figure. And SVI3 TFN within Hardware Info did support the original findings anyway. So Gigabyte's post here reinforces what we were stating earlier because we did not test the latest beta BIOS from them. Our post is before that existed. Just to make trying to make sure everyone's on the same page because it's really easy to lose track of the plot when there are multiple media outlets doing multiple different things that appear to be similar plus all these different motherboard vendors panicking and responding in different ways, releasing statements that are kind of clumsy sometimes. And uh, it's easy to kind of be manipulated into thinking like, oh, it was never a problem. But it was. It's just that now it's getting fixed. And then bringing it back to AMD2, AMD put out its own conflicting statements. It, for a while, it was talking about a 1.35 VSOC, safe max, 1.3 volt VSOC, safe max. We've heard 1.25 as well from people at AMD. Some of this hinges on X3D versus not, but the point is that AMD clearly, as we said in our initial piece, improperly communicated the needs to the motherboard vendors. Otherwise, you could not possibly have all these motherboard vendors accidentally make the same mistake uh, unless miraculously they all finally conspired to stab AMD in the back, which makes no sense whatsoever. So this is a situation where it is still poor communication between the vendors and AMD, which hopefully they're resolving now. Lack of validation from AMD on BIOSes from major flagship motherboards in the initial launches. Uh, and both of those issues are starting to get resolved. So that's good. That's what we wanted to see. And we're happy to see that the companies after uh, significant pressure from the community are responding in a way where they have more favorable warranties for problems that are not the end user's fault and where they have more competently built BIOSes and hopefully better validation internally in the future. So to recap, a perfectly precise theoretical measurement is irrelevant in the context of looking for a number that simply exceeds another number. So when you're seeking something that exceeds 1.3 volts, 
you don't need perfect precision because if you have the SVI3 number that indicates it exceeds 1.3 volts, which we did in the initial pieces, and you have external measurements that show uh, an additional line of support for that reading because you can't trust uh, intrinsically a measurement that has no additional means of being validated, it's sufficient to come to the conclusions of VSOC being too high because once again, being off by 0.13 volts here uh, is just so wildly unlikely as to be irrelevant, um, especially with at least three points of measurement and the hardware uh, info measurement that Gigabyte has now said is accurate, which supports those claims. So I know I'm repeating myself, but this is really important to get across because I want people to know if you're running the older BIOSes still, those are still problematic. You need to get on the newer BIOSes and the companies are still putting out updates and patches. Uh, at least Asus has gotten more favorable with its warranty language, which is excellent. We're happy to see them do that and really thrilled that they didn't just completely dig their heels in and fight everyone on it. So it's a good time to start updating and keep checking back occasionally over the next few weeks as they continue to iterate and improve on their biostability in general. So that's what's important to us, making sure everyone gets the message and doesn't get confused by uh, the corporate statements. I don't think the corporate statements, at least not gigabytes here necessarily, are trying to twist understanding. I think it's an outcome of too much information uh, without the context of time. It's easy to forget the timeline of things on the internet. And when you forget the timeline, something coming out later does not mean that an earlier thing was wrong. It means that the earlier thing has changed, which is the desired outcome. So uh, that's kind of it for this story. We have a little bit more, like I said, we have a really cool video where we worked with a, an attorney at law to talk about some of the early implications of ASUS's language and some of their new language and hopefully provide some understanding that you can apply to all consumer situations in the future, not just to the specific motherboard thing. Um, because we go into some legal language terminology, how a contract is formed between a consumer who reasonably has no power against a company who is writing the contract. It's extremely educational. I learned a lot from it and really excited about that interview. So that'll be going up over the weekend. Next one is from Lee and Lee about some gunk buildup problems within the Galahad AIO coolers. We reached out to Lee and Lee after seeing reports, especially from users in our inbox, uh, about failing Galahad CLCs and sent Lee and Lee an email, asked them for a statement, and they provided us some commentary and insight. Lee and Lee said that it became aware of the issue in quarter one of 2022. It took a while to say anything about it, but uh, it's known about it. It said that's when it started getting returns and defective units from users. After doing research with the suppliers in the factories, Lee and Lee said that its root cause was determined to be some units getting sent through a second round of soldering, which left flux behind within the radiator, and QC missed that flux. Radiators require cleaning internally before uh, getting filled and after soldering to get rid of residue and corrosive compounds. And we can extrapolate here that the failed units that went through a second pass maybe didn't get a second cleaning, or at least not a proper one. Lee and Lee claims that the faulty process was corrected near the end of 2021. So this issue is actually pretty old, and the people reporting the failures at this point, likely it just required a while for that gunk to build up to become noticeable to the user. Any units manufactured after quarter one of 2022, Lee and Lee says, are going to be safe. They said that there's a couple steps you can take to see if you're affected by this issue. First one is you can see if your performance has degraded. It should become noticeable because it would run very hot once there's sufficient buildup. And aside from that, you can check the serial number present either on the radiator itself or on the original box. This is shown in these images. Anything before serial number 202203 is eligible for a replacement. The press release page has a link to Lee and Lee's general contact us page where you should choose the warranty claim option and go from there. The company says it's prioritizing this problem and will continue to honor claims for replacement until every affected user is taken care of. And this phrasing is good. We like that because they're not putting an arbitrary time limit on how long the company will allow you to file that claim. And corrosion can be a really slow process. And because it's a slow process, it's probably why it took so long for us to hear even more reports about it because what some users may have just been in a situation where uh, the left behind residue wasn't bad enough or maybe they didn't check their thermals for a while and suddenly it looked bad. But either way, 
in theory, this should be fixed. Now, if you have a unit from after this serial number range and you have an issue with it, that's the range that Lee and Lee is saying should be fixed and should not have issues, please email us at team at gamersnexus.net and let us know. But check that serial number for us first and make sure it is actually after that number. Uh, because if it is and there's a problem, then we need to know about it so we can look into it further. But for now, taking it at face value, it sounds like they are replacing it without any uh, contest, which is excellent. There's no time limit on it, which is also excellent. We wish they acted a little faster here. Uh, Fractal and Arctic were much more proactive and aggressive with getting in front of users, but at least they finally said something. We're going to add this to our uh, catastrophic failure list on gamers.nexus, which is a new mini site we launched not long ago, actually this week. And that contains a list of products we have uh, independently verified are failing. And in this situation, we have been able to do so in working with Lee and Lee directly. And it came to a pretty quick conclusion uh, because they already had the answer at this point. So we'll add that to the list. And we're going to update that list with some uh, input from users in the future with some probably serial number ranges or model numbers. There's a lot of good ideas from users out there. So anyway, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching as always. Subscribe for more and go to store.gamersaccess.net to grab a shirt like this one, one of our mod mats, our solder mats, or more. And check back because we're going to have a ton of coverage from Computex in the coming weeks. Thanks for watching. See you all next time.